Today is not December the 25th, but it is Christmas. And it will be until January the 6th. Fred Craddock's mother did not think so. He says, on the evening of December 25th, she tossed the tree, put away the decorations, fed the family the leftovers, and announced it was 365 days until Christmas. For her, the Great Depression stole Christmas, widening the gulf between those who have and those who do not. Nevertheless, Craddock insists, today is Christmas, and so is tomorrow and tomorrow for the full 12 days of the Christmas season. We need every day of it to reflect on what God has done among us. One of the ways we reflect on what God has done among us is to talk about incarnation, the idea that God has come to us in human form. My Bible dictionary tells me that the Latin word incarnatio means to enter into or become flesh. It refers to the Christian doctrine that the pre-existent Son of God became man in Jesus. My theological dictionary tells me that this doctrine states that God, in one of the modes of His triune being, and without in any way ceasing to be God, has revealed himself to mankind for their salvation by coming amongst them as a man. The man Jesus is held to be the incarnate Word, or Son of God. The Gospel of John, however, tells me that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and lived among us. Now that's incarnation, when the Word that is God becomes flesh and lives among us. And that's what I want to talk to you about. As far as theological concepts go, the incarnation isn't as hard to grasp as the Trinity, the idea of one God in three persons, but it still isn't easy. One of the best treatments of the subject is in a book called God Was in Christ, written by Donald Bailey back in 1948 and still a classic. Bailey says, It is astonishing how many people assume that they know what the word God means. But it is still more astonishing that even when we profess Christian belief and set out to try to understand the mystery of God becoming man, we are apt to start with some conception of God, picked up we know not where an idol of the cave or of the marketplace, which is different from the Christian conception. And then to attempt the impossible task of understanding how such a God could incarnate in Jesus. That is, instead of looking at God through the clear and well-focused lens of Christ, we turn the telescope around and look at Christ through our clouded, preconceived notions of God. For example, if you begin with a God who is a kindly old grandfather, perhaps just a little senile, you will arrive at one understanding of Jesus. But if you start with a God who is a stern and unforgiving judge, you will arrive at quite another. I find this especially interesting in light of a recent book called America's Four Gods, written by two professors at Baylor University. According to Paul Fraze and Christopher Bader, the way Americans view God falls into four categories. Using the result from a 2008 survey, the authors demonstrate that about 28% of Americans believe in an authoritative God. Someone who has an authoritative God believes in a God who is very judgmental and very engaged in the world at the same time, said Bader, adding that they also tend to be evangelical and male. For 22% of Americans, mostly evangelical women, the Almighty is characterized as a benevolent God who is thoroughly involved in their lives but is loving, not stern. It's definitely a personal relationship, like a friendship, like a companionship, said one. Just in case somebody's not there for you, he's always there. 
Others believe in a critical God who is removed from daily events but will render judgment in the afterlife. Bader said, we find a strong tendency for people who are at lower levels of income and education to believe in the critical God. The fourth and final way that those surveyed view God is a distant God who set the universe in motion but then disengaged. Can you see how your understanding of God would affect your ideas about incarnation? If you thought of God as authoritative and judgmental, what kind of flesh would that God take on? If you thought of God as loving and benevolent, what human form would that God assume? What about a God who is critical or a God who is distant and disengaged? This is just the kind of problem Donald Bailey points out, that if we begin with our ideas about God and then imagine what sort of human form those ideas would take, we end up with a distorted understanding of the Incarnation. That is, instead of starting with some vague, unformed notion of God and putting flesh on it, we need to begin with Jesus and let Him show us what God is really like. But we don't always do that. David H. C. Reed says that we still find in our congregations many who struggle to fit the figure of Jesus into the image of God that they already possess. They seldom seem to wonder where it came from. Many sermons still seem to be based on the assumption that we all know what we mean by God, and the Christian, particularly the preacher, has to demonstrate how the figure of Jesus can be shown to match this image. So when we talk about the word becoming flesh, it makes a difference which word we start with. Some people seem to think of Jesus as the incarnation of the word truth. Others seem to think of him as the incarnation of the word love. Some think of him as the incarnation of justice, while others think of him as the incarnation of mercy. Gracia Grendel, professor of rhetoric at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, says, it is difficult to grasp the idea of a word becoming flesh, even when we see it realized in Jesus. And so, she suggests, one way for us limited human beings to understand incarnation is to think of how our words have become buildings. And that's something I can relate to. When I was a preacher in North Carolina, we started a new program called Wednesday Nights Alive that included a delicious dinner and programs for every age group in the church. We watched our attendance climb from the 20 faithful members who used to come to Wednesday night Bible study to more than 100 in the first few weeks. And then more and more people started coming until the small fellowship hall where we had our Wednesday night supper just wasn't big enough. I can still remember the day Ruth Troll came by the church office, slapped a check down on the secretary's desk and said, that's for the new fellowship hall. New fellowship hall, I said. What new fellowship hall? But Ruth wasn't the only one who thought we needed one. Eventually, I took all those suggestions and put them in a manila folder. I wrote the word building on the tab and put a question mark behind it, just to remind myself that at that point, at least, it was still just an idea. But over time, that folder began to fill up. We held congregational meetings to discuss the idea, and I put the notes from those meetings into the folder. We consulted with a couple of different architects to get an idea of what the new building would look like and where it might go on our property. One of those architects presented us with a rendering that made our mouths water. And it was then, when we could begin to picture that new building on our property, that the idea really took off. A few months later, we held a business meeting to vote on the new building, and the motion carried by an overwhelming margin. But that wasn't the end of it. 